welcome to the Brock Interview Series with host Thomas S. Orwatt Jr. Welcome to episode number 96 of the Brock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwatt Jr. It is March 4th, 2024. And for this feature, I have guitarist, songwriter, singer, Rick Emmett as my featured guest. Rick Emmett was a member of the multi-platinum selling power trio Triumph from 1975 to 1988, and again briefly in 2008. He was responsible for writing some of the band's most popular songs, including Hold On, Magic Power, Somebody's Out There, and many, many more. After Rick left Triumph, he established himself as a solo artist, and released his first solo record entitled Absolutely in 1990. During this interview, Rick talks about his new release, Diamonds, the best of the hard rock years, 1990 to 1995. This is a compilation record that consists of remastered songs from Rick's first three solo records. In addition, Rick reflects on his time playing in Triumph, his challenges as a solo artist, and much, much more. So here he is, Rick Emmett. Hey everyone, welcome to the Rock Interview Series, and today uh, I'm interviewing somebody that I've wanted to interview for a very long time, one of my favorite musicians ever, um, a person that was very instrumental in getting me to uh, play uh, guitar and influencing me as a musician, uh, Mr. Rick Emmett. Um, Rick, thank you very much for taking the time. I've, like I said, I'm really looking forward to this interview. You're welcome. My pleasure. I can't wait to get started. Fire away. Yes. Well, well, first of all, Rick, I want to ask you how you've been feeling. I know you've had some health issues and that, and, and I just, you know, I'm concerned and I just want to know that everything's okay with you. Uh, everything's not bad. You know, I can't say I'm 100%, but I'm 70 years old and, you know, um, by and large, I'm I'm pretty good. The uh, prostate cancer, I think, is uh, under control and... Um, being you know treated and and um, i'm taking some medications that uh, uh follow along after having the radiation um i'm getting some arthritis things that are starting to happen and it was getting into my hands which was worrying me a little but i've been playing pushing myself to play a little bit more guitar every day and i think it actually helps so you know um it's it's an interesting thing that music is therapeutic on a certain level um but it's also physically, it can be therapeutic for me, not just mental. And uh, certainly in terms of uh, just dealing with the whole idea of getting older and, and uh, having things starting to go wrong physically, it's like, well, that's not going to, it's not going to slow me down in terms of being creative and having fun and, you know, doing the things that I want to do as a, as a, as a creative person. So, you know, I'm writing, I'm playing, I'm, uh, I'm feeling good, you know, uh, thank you for asking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you must be doing something right because you look like you're no older than 40 years old. <laughs> well, um, I think I'm lucky that I was able to keep most of my hair, you know, uh, although, you know, in the uh, last stages of being a touring act, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, um, I started to have some anxiety issues and I started to lose patches of my hair. It's called alopecia areata. And I was losing uh, like little, you know, the size of a, you know, a silver dollar kind of, you go, what's happening there? And then, you know, you become very good artful at comb overs, you know? Um, but, you know, I mean, some guys are 20 and they, they start turning into Patrick Stewart, you know what I mean? And it's like, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I'm I'm lucky in some regards. Now, my my mom and my mom's mom, they were both young looking women into their old age, you know. So and people would always say, No, you can't be really you're oh wow, you don't look it, you know. So I think I was lucky that I inherited that. So I think luck has a fair has a fair bit to do with that. I don't think it has anything to do with the way I've been taking care of myself. Because I don't really think I've been taking care of myself. Well, okay. Well, it, it looks like you have. Uh, uh, one of the reasons we're talking today is because you have a new compilation that you um, that's coming out. Um, it's called uh, Diamonds, the Best of Hard Rock Years, 1990s and 1995. And what this is, is a compilation of songs from your first three solo records that you put out. It's kind of like a, a like a victory lap for you to like, you know, celebrate those uh, great three solo releases. 
victory lap. Um, yes, yeah, you know, I, I think you get to a certain age and stage, Thomas, and everything becomes a victory lap. You know, Triumph puts out a documentary, and it's like, oh, that's a that's a big victory lap. And then, you know, uh, I've put out my memoir, and I go, well, I guess that's a kind of a you're looking back and you're trying to put your house in order. And so that's a kind of a victory lap. And I thought the diamonds package of, of music would come out at the same time that the memoir did and that they were, there would be a kind of a marriage there, but you know, ECW was a little more efficient in their ability to get the book out than um, music in motion's ability to get the package. And then it, to, it, to be honest and fair, the, the, the diamonds package, it had a lot, it's got a lot to it. I mean the the actual um, deluxe version of it. It's got I don't know the kitchen sink. I think is one of the things you get to buy in there. No, but I'm joking. But you know, there's pictures and there's slip mats for for vinyl turntables and there's vinyl and there's CD and there's you know there's guitar picks and there's all this stuff. I go okay, well wow, you know. Um, but uh, so no wonder they had a harder time getting it to the marketplace. But it's, to answer your question from another direction, I don't feel like I'm taking victory laps and I don't feel like there's really anything to celebrate uh, that hasn't already been celebrated in maybe even more ways than I deserve. You know, like, and I don't mean to try and sound falsely modest. I just think humility is, a, is an important kind of thing in creative process. And so as a creative artist, somebody that wants to kind of keep pushing myself to find new ways to express myself or even take old ways that I express myself and reinvent them and, and you know, reshape them and readdress them. It's not so much victory lapping as it is going back and trying to fix the shitty mistakes I made. <laughs> you know, the things that I didn't quite get right, I'd like to, to you know, try and get them right. Um or, or make them so that they're better in the sense that they go, well, okay, no, here's where my mind just went on that. Did you get to see uh, the Grammys this year? Did you see Joni Mitchell sing Both Sides Now? Uh, no, it's hard for me to watch the Grammy Awards anymore, to be quite honest with you. I, I did see some yeah, highlights, but yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Joni, she's done this before. She, she pl played live, I think, at Newport with Brandy Carlisle, and you know, it's kind of like a Joni Mitchell uh, celebration of, you know, talk about victory lapping. But that song, Both Sides Now, when she originally wrote it, she was 23 years old. And that song had a certain kind of wisdom for a 23-year-old to be singing, which was like, wow, you know. But now she's in her 80s and she's singing that song. And when she does it, you go, wow, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different ball game you know and it's not victory lapping when the song is about life and it's about seeing life you know seeing love from both sides seeing life from both sides like seeing it so now where she sings the song and the the meaning that the song gets is i saw life when i was young and now i'm seeing life from when i'm old and you know what i know i know that i don't know anything that you know, that's what the, the message of the song essentially says, which to me it's profound, it's profoundly beautiful. It's it's a really great creative artist statement. I go, okay, I would like to make those statements when I'm in my 80s. You know, I would like to do that. Why I go victory lap, eh, you know, yes and no, you know, more no than yes, a little bit of yes, a lot more no. Yeah. The the interesting thing about your uh, solo career was right in the beginning of it. Um, I believe you played your very first solo shows in the United States in Buffalo at a place called Desiderio's. And I remember you playing two shows in one evening and it was the first time. And I, I haven't seen this since that you you actually asked the audience to stop cheering so loudly because they were overwhelming you because it was so loud and it was such a smaller arena. You 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 beg them. You go, please. I appreciate you. You're you're yelling and everything, but I can't hear. It's just too loud. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not the first one. You know, I mean, the Beatles stopped touring in 1966 because they went, "This is nuts. We we can't even hear ourselves think." You know, 
And certainly they couldn't hear each other play, you know. And this was in a time, of course, when before there were large monitor systems so that you could tell the monitor, to crank it up, I need to hear. But th that's happened to me on more than one occasion in my life. You know, I think Desiderius was probably the first time it really, you know, struck me. But I once played a duo gig down in, um, uh, where was it now? It was in Texas. It was in, um, I think it was Houston. And it was a bar, and it was a bar where it was a kind of a high stage with with a kind of a dance floor. It was almost like a country looking kind of place, big wood dance floor, lots of seating, but then a balcony and a, a deeper balcony that maybe had a couple of layers. So the sound could come down at you from, and when we walked on stage, it was so loud that it, it's like, it kind of freezes your brain a little bit. It's like when you get too much ice cream in your mouth and you get a brain freeze, like I'm going like, whoa, this is nuts. Like, you know, and I'm stunned and I'm going, hey, you take it easy. <laughs> Relax. Like, uh, you like, it's nice to be appreciated and it's nice to, um, to, for a crowd to have that kind of energy is an amazing thing, but it can get overwhelming, man. <laughs> like it can be like, whoa, take it easy. I, I, I have a job to do here. Let me, let me do my job. You know, don't get in the way of my job. Yeah. Were, were you um happy with with the way that you were promoted um in the United States with your solo career? Because it, it seemed like I mean the timing of it also was was kind of a weird time in music as far as like hard rock music goes. I mean, it was getting a little alternative alternative at the time. So um, you know, I because I, I wondered why, you know. You know, you you had the Buffalo gigs, but it it didn't seem like you ever went on like a like a major tour or anything like that. Even as like a support act for like a bigger band, was that you know a, a calculated movement by you, or was it something that you know just the the offers never came? A little bit of both. And here's what happened: like you know, this Diamonds package coming out is it's an interesting thing for me because I'm going back and I'm the Absolutely album the Spiral Notebook, sorry, the Ipso Facto and Spiral Notebook. So three albums from 1990 to 1995, which is the time period you're asking about. And that Absolutely album, when it first came out, I had a deal with Charisma Records. I made a publishing deal with Universal Music. I was in the catbird seat. It was going to be great. And they started servicing the two first singles to FMAOR radio. So Big Lie and Saved by Love. Saved by Love was doing amazing. It was, it had gone top five in like two weeks. And I was thinking, oh, this is, we're teeing this up. This is going to be awesome. And Charisma went bankrupt. They had been working the Right Said Fred single. And they'd, you remember that? I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my, yeah. I, I so, do remember that. Yeah, I, I worked in a music. I was a manager of a record store at the time. So I, I remember really well, I you know, that whole time I, re, you know, was was managing and Vanilla Ice. I It was so popular that I had a, it, when we scanned the UPC code for Vanilla Ice, it wouldn't scan. So we had to memorize it. I can still tell you what it is because we sold so <laughs> many of it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, well, see, there you go. So so your point about the, the um the, the the business itself being in flux. That's a good one. But first we'll address the one of, of charisma going. So if your label goes down the toilet, there goes your album. And it wasn't just me. 38 Special had a pretty good record. You remember that great song? Uh, this heart needs a second chance. Like great, great tune. And those poor guys, like rug got pulled out from under them. How about Jellyfish? You remember that act? That was an incredible album. I really loved that album. And gone. Like overnight, you're and it, it's like it's a career destroyer because your label is the one that has to do promotion to rap uh, to radio. You know, you're kind of looking for tour support help from time to time. There's all of these things. So you're talking about getting on other tours with another act. Well, who wants an opening act? that hasn't got records in the record store, that hasn't got radio airplay happening and has no future uh, potential for any of that. It's not like you could even hook onto something and go, don't worry, it's going to happen. Like that would be a lie because it's not going to happen. You don't have a record company anymore. You don't have a record deal. 
So that was a real, holy crap. And it's not like I didn't get a nice advance for that album and get a really nice advance for the publishing deal. I did. But now publishing companies going, what? No record deal. What? Like no rare play. What? So they're kind of going, oh, no, we thought this guy was going to turn into three, four albums, building a whole career out of triumph. All of a sudden, the rugs pulled up from under that, too. So you're back to square one at it with everything. Now, having said that, here's what starts to happen. MTV is going, yeah, 40-year-old guy that used to be in an arena rock band. Mm. You know, we're even transitioning out of hair bands now, buddy. We're heading towards your your Soundgarden and Nirvana and your uh, Pearl Jam and you know, and right around the corner here comes Creed and all of these other kinds of bands with guys that sing down here, you know. And it's like they don't want to hear me and my e John Anderson kind of voice anymore. Like they're going. Oh, he sings too high. We don't want that stuff. So th that transitioning was happening too at the same time. And uh, having said all of that, you're caught in this thing of, you know, you, I was this guy in Triumph, and you know this because, you know, you saw me at Desiderio's, okay, but you saw me at the Memorial Auditorium, you know. You saw me when I was a rock star playing the rock star game at its highest level. So you're coming out of that, and you're going on your own, and, you know, then everybody's going, yeah, but you're not in triumph anymore. Ooh. Uh, well, will you play some of the triumph songs? And you go, yeah, but I have, well, I have some new songs and I would like to play those. Yeah. But you know, if you were just doing a, like a triumph tribute, that would be cool. And you go, what? No, no. What, what are you talking about? Like triumph will be doing its triumph tribute. I don't need to be doing that. I, I'll, I'll play some of my songs, you know, I'll play some of the songs triumph didn't play. Like, we didn't play Hold On live, but the Rick Emmett band did, you know, and I'll go, oh, well, I'll do that. And they go, well, I don't know, man. And so that whole idea of trying to, you know, generate, it was kind of like I had to go back to square one and start at concert clubs and small theaters and, and you know, then summertime outdoor stuff. Like I could get the summertime outdoor stuff my whole life right up until I retired, you know. But yeah. that was that was kind of the lay of that land. Even though you had all that adversity with the first record release, it still got up to number 52 in America on the Billboard charts, which for that time is really pretty impressive. I mean, considering the fact that, you know, it's your first record as a solo artist. I mean, that that shows that you really have had quite the fan base that still believed in you. Yeah, well, you know, and, and it, Charisma did a good job out of the box. The problem was, the, you know. <laughs> it didn't get sustained. You know? For those people, anyone that's interested in, in purchasing this, um, how can they purchase this set? Uh, Rock Paper Merch is the, it's a kind of a merchandising company that and then they decided, you know what would be great if we did vinyl records? And then the guy said, you know what would be great if I turned that into sort of having my own little label? And so uh, that's kind of what that is uh and so rockpapermerch.com and uh yeah that's how they can find it mm -hmm. you also played your your final u.s show in the buffalo area at the riviera theater and uh i called your bluff i really didn't think it was going to be your last show and uh unfortunately i didn't see it but is there any possibility that you might do some like one-offs like in america again that you know Maybe not a full tour, but maybe like one show or that. Uh, the the lady that does my social media, Kathy Wagner, she's also a sort of a, she manages some acts and she's a booking agent for things. And she says, well, the guy that owns the Riviera Theater, every time I talk to him, he says, hey, when can I get Rick Emmett back? You know, let's get him out of retirement. You know, I'll pay for the immigration to get him across the border. Come on, you know, and I go. But I, you know, when I. After that year, that was December, I played one more gig at the at Hughes Room in Toronto before it closed. And these kinds of things, man, they kind of they feel like the end of an era when a place that I loved to play that was around my old neck of the woods from where I grew up. When it closes, you kind of go, oh, geez, you know, now, you know, never say never. Right. And and um, 
I have played one-offs from time to time, and I am like the, and I've got this uh, memoir out, and now this diamonds thing. Like I'm doing an interview thing up at the Bra uh, Rose Theater in Brampton in April. A friend of mine, Cameron Smiley, is going to interview me, and I'm going to play a few little things on guitar. Probably won't play a full song of anything, but you know, just a conversation, right? And uh, people go, oh, "Will you come and do a poetry reading at the local library?" And I go, "Yeah, all right, sure. You know, yeah." I'll do that. Um, so it's not like I'm going to disappear from the, the, the face of the earth. And my old pal, Blair Packham, who, by the way, I should tell you this. I uh, wrote 10 guitar pieces that I played on this guitar. And I had this guitar made, and it's a Telecaster, uh, and it's really light, and, and it's perfect for an old guy. And um, so I wrote 10 pieces, and I recorded them. My friend Blair Packham came and engineered for me. And... Uh, yeah, so so when the whole thing kind of ended just before COVID, I stopped paying union dues. I stopped, you know, applying for visas. Like, I, I went, okay, the road, I'm done, you know. And I am certainly, I remain done with the idea of, hey, uh, the back of the tour bus, uh, in and out of hotels, in and out of venues, sound checks. Uh, I go, no, I'm done. Like, I definitely don't want to have to do airports anymore, any of that stuff. But if somebody, like, I went to Sweden and I played a one-off on New Year's. I don't know if you've heard about this, but no. a friend of mine puts a band together for the uh, World Junior Hockey Championships. Every year they go and they do these things. And it's because the guy that is the sort of tour package guy, he likes to get a chance for he and his wife to sing background vocals in the, and they so they call this thing the Canadian Cover Crew. And I've done a few little studio videos for them. I did a uh, you, you know, you if you haven't checked this out or your viewers and listeners haven't, uh, I did a thing where I did Eleanor Rigby with a string quartet and I sang it and, and uh, it was great. It was a lot of fun. And it was. Uh, and so on the basis of these things, he goes, come on, man, you know, we're going to be in Gothenburg, Sweden this year. I go, oh, it's a long way to go for one gig, you know. He said, yeah, but, you know, you get to see some good hockey and and it'll be Cracker Jack Band. And, and they had like Larry Gowan's brother, Terry, playing bass, Terrence Gowan on bass, uh, Bob McBride on guitar, um, Mike Shotton, my old pal on drums. He's the guy that kind of talked me into it. Uh, Ross Woolrich on keyboards and the music director. They had a string quartet on one side of the stage with my old pal Claudio Venna, Claudio Venna playing uh, viola. And they had this Cracker Jack horn section that they hired from Sweden. And so, and then it was kind of like a glorified wedding band because it's a New Year's gig. So it's like, you got to have dance stuff. And when he said to me, well, like we're putting the set list together. I go, well, man, you got to have like some Earth, Wind and Fire on there. And you got to have some Cool in the Gang celebration. Like it's New Year's, you, you know, you got to have this stuff. And so, and he had some ABBA tunes. His wife was going to sing some ABBA tunes. And so in rehearsal of the day, you know, the uh, December 31st, we, we rehearsed, like we played Waterloo and the Dancing Queen. And so at the rehearsal at the end, I go on the mic and I go, all right, I can I can chuck that one off on my bucket list. I just played two ABBA songs in Sweden. Wow. <laughs> and the horn section guys, they were killing themselves laughing because they're going like, yeah, what is this guy doing here? You know, like, but uh, it was fun. And so I had fun. If it's fun, I might say yes, you know, but chances are I'm not going to go on the road, you know. Um, Rick, the very first time that I heard of Triumph, um, and again, um, this is while living in Buffalo, is, is I was 12 years old, and I was watching Saturday Night Live, and I saw this commercial on TV. Now, at this time, I was just just basically just into rock and roll. I was a Kiss fan, so that was pretty much it. And then I saw this commercial for this band called Triumph, and they had, they had explosions, kind of like Kiss, and some really cool music. And it was like two days after Christmas, they were playing at Klein Hands Music Hall in Buffalo. And uh, I I needed to tell like my family members what I wanted for Christmas. And immediately after that commercial, I wrote it down, Triumph tickets. So I asked for Triumph tickets. And, and, nice. then I, and I found out that you had a record called Rock and Roll Machine. So for that Christmas, 78, I got two tickets for the concert at Klein Hands. And I, I got the Rock and Roll Machine. And from, from Christmas Eve to like... Right before I left, I played that record nonstop. So I like I was ready for this show. 
And I'll tell you, it was it was amazing. It was my second rock concert I ever went to. It was Triumph and Talus. And uh, yeah, a lot of people know Talus as uh, Billy Sheehan's band, but Billy Sheehan was not in the band at the time. It was David yeah. Constantino and Paul Varga, and they had, I can't remember their names, but they had two other guys in Talos. And Triumph came on with all these lights, and it was, it was insane. Do you do you remember it? Any chance you yes, remember that particular show? I do. Uh, yeah. Now, the thing is, we played Klein Hands twice, I think, because we played it on the Just a Game Tour as well. You did. But you played I two nights then. Yeah. You did yeah. Two. And so, you know, my memory is more of the, of the just a game nights than it is of the, of the rock and roll machine tour. But uh, first of all, let me tell you this as a, as a, you know, Buffalo area guy, when I got to play Klein hands, I thought, Oh, okay. We've, we've kind of made it now <laughs> because now we crossed the border and we weren't playing like, you know, McVans or, you know, and, and we'd play, we played some of the bars, you know, Uncle Sam's was Niagara Falls, but there was another one that we would play in Lockport after dark. After dark, we right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we played there a couple of times. So Klein Hands was like, oh, we've moved up into the world, you know, and, and I and it had a kind of a thrust proscenium style. It was more of a, a a concert hall for an orchestra to sit on a stage as opposed to a rock band. But I would jump out over our lights and go running around you know, in the area that was in front of the strings of chaser lights that we had. And uh, and I always liked those kind of gigs because it was kind of like, once you did that, then the spotlights would be following you. And I thought, I've separated myself from the band and now I'm out here, you know, doing my solos. Um, so, yeah, I, I do remember it. And, and uh, because, of course, I grew up in Toronto and we would see Buffalo television all the time, you know, um, WGR and WPEN and you know th those stations and um, there would be ads for oh playing this Saturday at Klein Hands and so to me Klein Hands in my mind was like oh it's a concert hall you know that's what this place is and so we were moving from bars to concert halls and I was going I'm a concert musician now you know I go on concert tours you know so and I do remember it and and I have a deep affection for playing Buffalo. It was kind of like playing Toronto, except it wasn't. It was this other whole big market where you could play a big barn. And, you know, like when we would go play Buffalo, I would rent uh, limos so that my brother and his girlfriends and they, they could all, my wife, they, they could all come down in these limos, you know, drive across the border and, you know, drive into the building and, and be in the basement of the building in the limo. And like at the hockey rinks, you could do that, right? So, and once we got up into the war memorial, like the, the there was the odd in Buffalo, but there was the war memorial in Secu Syracuse and in Rochester. And so you could kind of go across upstate New York on your way over to the East Coast. And uh, it became a fairly standard run. We'd go, you know, so we would play Buffalo almost every tour. There would be no, and it was a big market for us. Radio was big for us. And I mean, it's bad to, uh, probably politically incorrect to be raising the name of uh, Harvey Weinstein, but Harvey and Corky were the promoters. And there was a guy, Eddie Tice, and he was kind of like Harvey's guy and he became our guy. And Eddie would come out to the shows. He'd be hanging with us. And, and Eddie would set these things up. So like we were coming to town and he would say, okay, after soundcheck, we got to go over to the mayor's office. They're going to give you the key to the city. And I would go, Okay, Eddie. Great. You know, hell, we would go and we would get the key to the city of Buffalo, and it would be like, well, this is. I mean, we only ever got the key to three cities: Buffalo, um, San Antonio, Texas, and uh, Mississauga, the, the town we grew up in. So those were the only three keys we ever got. So pretty good, you know. Yeah. Well, well, Triumph was very popular all throughout the United States, but in Buffalo and Western New York, you guys were rock gods. I mean, you, you were like one of the, I would say one of the top three most popular bands for a long time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, part of that too is of course, Rush had already kind of teed things up so that it was like, Hey, there can be hard rock bands from Canada that, you know, can be very successful in other parts of the world. And so when we would come in, we could act like we were bigger than we really were because Rush had already kind of knocked the door down, you know, and we could come in and then people would go, 
yeah, these guys are huge. And we go, well, we're not huge yet, but we're going to be. <laughs> you know, we're big in your market now, you know, so. Yeah, I remember in my high school, though, there was this, like, rush versus triumph thing. It was like, you know, you, you couldn't like both bands. You had to pick one. And I was I was always on Team Triumph. And uh, I, I thought our numbers were pretty boy. Good for you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I yeah, thought I, our, I think our numbers were pretty high too. I think it was pretty like equal split between Triumph and Rush fans at the time. Yeah, depending on the town you were in and the radio airplay, like that, that's a huge part of it, right? If radio plays you, then you can be, you'll be big, and you haven't even played the market yet, and already your songs are big, your, your reputation is big. It was a beautiful thing. Of, I mean, that with the song "Magic Power" on Allied Forces. It's it's literally about that thing. And of course, Rush kind of did the same thing with Spirit of Radio that, you know, th there was this thing that could happen where your music would take on a, a proportion that. But, you know, I would like to think that when Triumph did come to town and did do its live show, we left nobody feeling like they'd got you know, cheated. <laughs> the people want to, oh, I got my money's worth. Hey, they had a propane torch. <laughs> they, they, they shot off about a million flash pots, you know. So, and th that was a thing about Triumph. It was a little bit more of an everyman kind of band than Rush. Rush was a little bit more of a esoteric, progressive kind of band in the genre of your Led Zeppelins and Pink Floyds. And they, you know, they were that kind of a, uh, an intellectual thinking man's kind of a band. Whereas Triumph was more like, because especially the influence of Gil Moore, he wanted it to be like Kiss or he wanted it to be like, yeah, you know, a bad company, Ted Nugent. Like he liked harder rock. He liked rock that had attitude. He liked production. He liked shows, you know, that, that put on a show, you know? Um, so you know, I was a little more like, hey, the music is all right. You know, we could we could rely on the music, you know. <laughs> and No, we're not relying on the music. I'm going to do my drum solo with strobe lights from nine different directions. OK, all right. Well, it definitely worked in, in the fact that it was kind of like the hook that, that grabbed you in. But I mean, musically, you guys were, you know, much more sophisticated than, say, a kiss. And and for, for me, like when I got the, the just a game record. And I was like, you know, studying guitar and I brought in, you know, suitcase blues because I love that song and I wanted to learn how to play it on my guitar. And my guitar teacher showed me and, you know, I, I could kind of do a, a good representation of it. I mean, you know, as a as a 13 year old at the time. But I remember my parents going, that's why we're paying for you to go to guitar lessons to play stuff like that. So that was the kind of like influenced me to like even look for more things like that, you know, to make my parents happy. Right. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I felt like it was kind of my role in Triumph to try and make it be musically more sophisticated and, uh, you know, to push at the borders and the boundaries of, oh, it's, it's rock. It's going to be just, you know, rock, hard rock. And I'd go, well, it could be progressive in a little bit of, in some ways, you know, and it can be more about just music and songs. It doesn't always have to be about the projection of an image or the projection of a style, we, we can go to other styles. That's what artists do. You know, you, 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 you push at yourself to try to see what you can do. And I mean, to kill in my credit, like suitcase booze is a good example. And when I would play it for, for almost all of my touring life, it was the closing song, even in duo shows, solo shows, it was always the last song of the night. And I would say, Hey, you know, um, I'm really lucky that I happened to be in a band with two guys that said, you know what? Good song. It deserves to be on a record. We'll put it on ours. It can be the last song, like a PS at the end of just a game and, and we can have it there, you know? Um, and I'm lucky that they allowed me that they gave me that latitude inside of the band on the records. I got to do classical guitar pieces and I would push at the guys and they would, they would take a shot at some of these more. And I think, you know, I mean, the first album had Blinding Lights. It was a song that I wrote with the guys in Act Three before I was even in Triumph. And when I brought it, they, you know, they were desperate for material when we were going to do the first album. And I said, well, I got this thing. And we kind of dumbed it down because some of the sections were had odd bars and odd time signatures, very more like Rush. And then Triumph said, no, let's make it 4-4. Four, four. Let's make it 
you know, make the riff go dunk dunk a doom dunk dunk a ding ding dunk dunk a ding dunk a dong dong, like just straight, you know. Um, so and we did, and and the but it got it was one of the first things to get airplay out down in Texas. It broke the band, and I think Mike and Gil went, oh, I guess we're going to have to give Rick a lot of lap. A lot of latitude here. It seems that the qualities that he brings, that's helping raise our game. It's and you know, by the time we got to just a game and, and hold on and, and lay it on the line, those were songs that started to become evergreen kinds of radio songs. I was the one that understood how to get the band on the radio. You know, I think even more than 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 well, certainly more than Gil, maybe not Mike. Because Mike had ears, he had producer kind of ears, and uh, but of course Mike was always caught in this thing of well, Gil would like to be the singer of the band, and he would like to be the leader of the band, and he would like to be the production manager of the band, and Rick is you know so Mike was always kind of caught in the middle of that stuff, and uh, yeah, you know I think the documentary sort of made that fairly clear and then if it didn't my memoir sure it certainly did so yeah that 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 whole the dynamics between you three were very interesting because you know when i first as a kid when i was watching triumph i just had assumed that you know it was basically you were the front man and you were like the leader of the band and it wasn't until later that i realized i was actually gill and and mike that you know formed the band and i mean it wasn't the internet back then i mean you'd get music magazines and read it but you know, you really couldn't research things like you can now, you know, so that yeah. that was that kind of like kind of made me understand a little more why maybe you went solo. I'm not, you know, 100 percent sure if that played a role, but I'm assuming that maybe did a bit. A bit? <laughs> no, a lot. <laughs> a yeah. lot yeah. I mean, you know, totally. It's like in the end, it's like, well, Triumph was really in the end. It was Gil's band It from the get go. It was. And then right through to, you know, why did I decide to leave? Because it was Gil's band. It wasn't mine, you know. And uh, as much as I tried to make it be mine in certain ways, it, that was never going to happen because it was Gil's band. You know, he was the leader on the contracts. He was the guy that sort of general managed the band. And I think the documentary that we did made it pretty clear, you know, uh, there was a scene in there, you know, when you were saying about you assume as a kid, you were assuming, oh, it's Rick's band. Rick's the guy, right? But um, it, it was it was uh, Sebastian uh, Bach from any any they were interviewing him and he goes and then in the middle of the concert and then the drummer comes down off of the riser and he's and I'm going what it's the the the, the, the drummer is the front man and I go oh yes and that's the truth of it F from backstage and from the beginning of the band all the way through it was it was Gil's band you know it was. And when you saw things like flash pots going off the way they did, laser lights happening the way they did, flamethrowers happening, cop car lights, all of these kinds of things, it was because that was the band that Bill envisioned, you know? And, um, hey, I was happy to be in it. I was on this roller coaster that was... Are you kidding me? You know, it was great. I, I could afford to buy a house. I could afford to buy a house for my parents, you know, like... There was a lot of great things about the success of Triumph that, and I owed a lot to Mike and Gill. Mike was the guy that understood radio on a level, like he was a great promotion marketing kind of guy. And, um, and he looked the part on stage. He had the, he, you know, had the hair that, and the mustache. He looked like the cowardly lion, you know, from to Wizard of Oz. And, and he would kind of, you know, walk around the stage and, it was like he looked like a rock star. He acted like one. He was skinny like one, you know, uh, like it, it all worked. Each guy had his own identity. And uh, there was a balance there. There was a balance of power, too. But in the end, it kind of got unbalanced, you know. Uh, did, did you, when you went solo, did you have any ambition at all to bring some of that pyro with you? <laughs> you know, if you got to the point where you're playing arenas or was that you were solely focused on the music at that point? Well, no, I understood, for example, I knew I knew how important a great light show could be. You know, Genesis would have a light show that would be just in, incredible, you know, um, and tours like Michael Jackson and like production it be, had become something that there was no way around it. 
I mean, here's an example. The other day, I just went to see, last week I went to see Britt Floyd because my the guy that had played drums for me when I went solo, Randy Cook, he was in the band. And um, the Britt Floyd thing, they've got the, you know, the big half moon with the lights all the way around it and then the round circle inside with the lights all around it. And they're doing all of these light effects that, you know, Pink Floyd did way back in the day. And, but they've got four lasers and they're doing the lasers like Pink Floyd did and everything. And I'm going, okay, I've seen this before. And I remember when that was the era of production, you needed to come up with something that was going to be your thing, it had to be unique. You know, the Triumph sign was going to make us unique. Um, all of that, kind of, like uh, the Triumph, the, I think the third incarnation of the Triumph sign, it was full of more aircraft landing lights than you would have at an airport. So that when the Triumph thing went, whoa, Triumph, Triumph, like it would burn in your eyes, in the retina of your eyeballs. And now if you blinked, it said Triumph. Like you were never going to get rid of that for the next 15 minutes, you know? It's like that was intentional. It was like we were going to brand you, you know, and and uh, that was that was the game, you know. But when I went solo, did I want to play it on that level? Not really. Yeah. What I wanted to do was make music a little more seriously and explore a little bit more of a progressive kind of side. But the business was changing so fast that that was not going to happen. You know, like yeah. I realized that. And I did the first amount of touring. You had asked me earlier about this. The The whole idea of touring, it start, my band started to fall apart. Randy wanted to leave. He wanted to go to Europe and tour with Lee Aaron. And, and uh, uh, the replacement drummer that I hired, Chris Brockway, the bass player, didn't like him. And then that all fell. Off. And then I just went, this is a mess. Oh, and I had a, a woman in the band, Colleen Allen, playing saxophones and stuff. And this was... For me as an artist, this was great. This was what I wanted. I wanted to become a more worldly, more grown up kind of a thing than, you know, rock and roll. Um, but of course, she needed to have her own dressing room. She needed to have her own room on the road in the hotels. And now the guys in the band didn't want to double up anymore. And they're going, well, Colleen's got her own room. How come we can't have our own rooms? I'm going, because I can't afford it. And it was a big band. And it was expensive, you know. And so then I went, okay, the industry doesn't really like me the way I am anymore. Uh, inside the band, it's not great. I go, I think I'm going to let everybody go. And then I'm going to start from scratch again. And so I hired a quartet to, to go out on tour. No second guitar, no, no horn player, you know, just no uh, uh, keyboards, me, bass, drums. And it was going to be just Rick singing and playing his tunes. And of course, what had started to happen for me was the world was like going, well, Rick, you'll play, you'll play triumph songs, right? He's going to play triumph songs. And it was like, okay, so I'll play triumph songs, you know, because I want to make a paycheck. I want to be able to put my kids through college. <laughs> like, like uh, this is, this is the way I, I can read the writing on the wall. Yeah, but a lot of those triumph songs that people wanted to hear were were really your songs. I mean, basically, I mean, those were your songs, but under the band name Triumph. Yeah, no, no, that that's true. And honestly, I think the bands that I had in the early stages, when I would play them, I thought those songs sounded better, <laughs> better than they'd ever sounded when Triumph. Did them. I mean, I, I'm not trying to put the other guys down. I'm just saying. Like uh, Levine, Mike could not really sing harmonies live very well at all. He never sang them in the studio and stuff. And in fact, we would get females in to sing backgrounds on like Hold On. And, and I would do my own vocal harmonies for Lay It On The Line and those things. Gil's voice would get added, but he wasn't really a reliable harmony singer either. And I wanted harmony. And so when I finally had my own bands, like Lay It On The Line, Hold On, ordinary man that there, there was really nice harmony singing on all of the choruses and i was going hallelujah you know this is what i this is how what i always heard in my head it's nice to finally get to hear it on stage i've done some uh really interesting interviews with some you know notorious songwriters and, and a lot of times they say that you know as time goes on these songs of theirs like kind of evolve into like you know much further than what they were originally i mean did you kind of feel that 
with your songs too at that point where the, your songs were you know like a lay it on the line or hold hold on were like evolving at, every time you play it a little more absolutely yeah and of course you know the reason that you and i are talking today is because the diamonds package is coming out some of these songs are 40 years old i wrote them even before then you know um and i listen to them and i go wow i never realized it had this shade to it you know and we're not even talking about live performances that have evolved over the course of time. We're talking about what has happened to the way I perceived the recording from way back then. And it's just, I've changed. The world has changed. Technology has changed. You know, um, the, these these uh, songs, you remix them. Well, we didn't remix. We, we remastered. And But you remaster them and you go, whoa. And then I realized, like, for example, the songs that were on Spiral Notebook, I had a guy named Bill Kipper master them in Montreal and he did an unbelievable job. And now Vic Branco has remastered these. And I, I get to hear a, 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 a really genuinely good remastering of a thing that was already really well mastered. And I go, Oh, listen to that audio. Like uh, the whole idea of a song comes out of speakers and you know, they're, they're here, but then can you make the music, you know, Get, get in your face out of the speakers and some guys are they're better at it than others and certainly mastering engineering is not something that i consider a, a high skill of mine you know i know a little bit about it i've sat in enough sessions that i know what's going on but it's not my thing but the guys that do have it as their thing they can make magic happen you know true uh, it likes that magic power kind of thing. It's like music has that quality, that propensity that it can, you know, uh, move around in the air and get inside your head and start traveling up your cochlea to your brain. And there's an infinity waiting there of how you're going to react to it. Right. So all of that stuff is like that's constantly happening. Like there's no wonder that music ends up being a tremendously therapeutic tool for Everything from folks that have Alzheimer's uh, to, to uh, you know, kids that have, um, you, you know, uh, deficit disorders and, and, and you know, um, I, I, I think music probably has an ability to do things in the brain that we don't even understand it yet. You know, we, we play our games of uh, commercial, you know, we're trying to have hit songs. and But I think music can be... I, you know, more, so much more because I, I I liked it when I was a kid listening to a choir singing in a church. And that music, it's not because it's it's not trying to get on the hit parade. <laughs> you know, it's not, yeah. you know, when you go to see a symphony orchestra play, that music speaks to me on a level that I go, this is why I wanted to be a musician, because I, I like what this music does. I like what it can be. And it's not trying to be popular successful commercial today you know like symphonies that were written by Dvorak and Bartok and you know that like Bach and Beethoven and Mozart like that music it's about doing something that's timeless and 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 classic in a, a different way than classic rock you know but your question is kind of saying hey in classic rock, isn't there this thing that kind of makes it so that the music evolves? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And it's even better with bands like Steely Dan, who took it seriously on every level that you possibly could. You know, Rush took it you know, every level. Led Zeppelin, you know, that you listen to those records and you can hear stuff. The, the Beatles were really the ones that started it. They were the ones that went, not going to tour anymore. Can't hear myself think, but I'm going to go into the studio and I will treat it like my playground, my creative playground. And I will do things so that you listen to Sergeant Peppers 50 years from now and you're going to go, wow, and I never realized, I never realized that was there. That, that's there. Wow. And they knew, they knew what they were doing. You know, it was art on a high um. level. Yeah, and and not only that, but it's also a great time machine too. I mean, you hear a song and it could bring you back like great memories. I I mean, a lot of the Triumph songs, I can tell you exactly, you know, when I heard, I could tell you what the weather was like. 
you know, and, and like you asked me like what I had for lunch yesterday and I can't tell you, but I can tell you something that happened like 50 years ago. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a time machine. It really honestly is. It brings back great memories. And I think that's why some of the legacy bands, you know, like people just don't want to give up and like they want to hold on to these memories and these bands. So that's why you know, these bands are 50 years old and haven't put out anything in 20 years can still like sell out arenas. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And it's true. Like all of the stuff that I'm talking about sort of from a progressive, you know, moving forward kind of a way, this thing of go being able to go back well, because it, it's tied to your nostalgia and it's tied to your memories and it's tied to you with things that you hold dear. And I mean, the biggest thing of all is, you know, like I would go up play a gig, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, 10 years ago and play a song, a triumph song. And then the audience, there's this rise of recognition and this swell of, of a, an emotional kind of a reaction to the song. And really what you're feeling is these folks are going, yeah, my life mattered. The, you were the soundtrack to my life and my life matters to you because you're still playing my songs. And, and this is the connection we share that, and it, that's the feeling you're getting, you're getting their own sense of, um, of how the, it's, it's like they're looking back through their high school yearbook and they're going, Oh, remember that? So, and that's a powerful thing. It, it, it you know, it, it's a very human thing, you know, and, and, I was, uh, I felt uh, uh, honored that I would that I was could be part of that kind of emotional, uh, meaningful kind of uh, thing. Like I always wanted to 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 have music that I made become something that other folks would go, um, man, this guy makes me feel stuff. This guy makes me think about stuff. He makes me feel stuff, and. That's all I ever really wanted, you know. Um, I didn't need to sell enough that I could get, you know, a really fancy guitar or a platinum record or a, you know, all of those things were, they were nice. <laughs> I'm not going to say I wasn't happy to get them. I was. But really what I was after was that human connection. You know, that's, it, it still matters to me, whether I have an audience of one or 100 or 1,000 or whatever. Your songs were, were great musically, but lyrically also, oh my God, like, hold on. I mean, the th lyrics and that, it's just like, when you're like a kid and you're hearing that, I mean, that that's like, that's like gospel to you. I mean, those, those lyrics can take the worst day you've ever had and just like make it motivate you into like, you know, screw this, man. I'm, I got this, you know, and just things like that. I mean, I'm sure you hear that all the time. Yeah. In different ways I do, but it's always nice to hear. And, you know, um, it's nice to know that the feeling that I had in my guts when I was putting that song together and thinking, okay, take this to the studio, play it for the boys, you know, just describe to them how I want it and, 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 you know, try to, <laughs> try to, try to uh, bend their arms in order to get them to do it the way that I want to do it. Uh, um, but that that the message that was in it was something where it's like to me, I felt like I'm in this band called Triumph. Why? Why is it called Triumph? Which, uh, triumph of what? And it was like, and to me, it became well a triumph of the, the human spirit. Triumph of these these kids that ju jump up onto their seats when we blow off flashpots and pump their fists in the air. I don't want it to be like Nuremberg. I don't want it to be like a rally about the wrong things. How can I make it be about the a positivity, like a motivation and an inspiration? And so that was the thing that, and that and when I originally joined it, I I didn't realize that's what Triumph was going to become for me. But by 1979, I sort of figured it out, you know. And so I, and I was lobbying hard for that. And then, so the whole side of Triumph that was, you know, geez, uh, lay on the line, the magic, uh, hold on to your dreams. Uh, never surrender, magic power of the music, fight the good fight. These were all things that were like about self-empowerment, you know, like yep. I was not religious. To me, fight the good fight. Well, the fight was the fight that you you choose your battles. You decide what it is that you want to believe in and you decide w when you want to pick a fight, you know, like when you're going to stand up and say, I'm sorry, you, you've pushed me around far, far enough. I can't take it anymore. I, you know, 
uh, this is where I'm going to draw my line. And so that to me was the fighting, you know, fight a good fight was where you decided your own lines were going to be drawn, you know? Um, yes. I was leaning fairly heavily on St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, but I, you know, I'm, I was not being biblical. I was not being Christian uh, as much as the morality of Christianity. W it works for me. I think it's great. You know, the golden rule is a pretty good rule, you know, yeah. and in triumph, that, those were the kinds of things that I was trying to say, you know, like this morality is a good morality. Feel good about yourself. And man, there were so many letters we would get to the fan club that were like, you know, my, my, my mom is an alcoholic. My sister committed suicide. You know, I was thinking about committing suicide. And then your music saved me, you know. And that was something that was like, okay, this has gone beyond whatever commercial transaction there was when we were, you know, putting a commercial on TV and going, triumph, well, our mission is to blow up the country. And, you know, some kids going, all right, I got to come see them and, and they're they're blowing off flashpots and they they've got a flamethrower and so you know um, I I feel like um, I was able to take the equation and modify it somewhat so that it became about something a little more substantial than that and I think that's probably why I'm sitting here talking to you now right it, it's a good part of it yeah I mean it's it, those songs were just. Just you were my favorite band, and it was because of songs like that, you know, and it, and because of your guitar playing as well. So it's the complete picture I got, you know. So and 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 you're a good example too. Like when I went to see Triumph, you know, I didn't, I wasn't influenced to go go, you know, back in the fields and drink like Jack Daniels the next day, like if I saw Van Halen or something like that, you know. It was a pretty good influence, you know. It's like, you know, I, you know I'll, I'll study for an exam instead of going out with my friends drinking or something, and, you know, play my guitar. So that was a right that was a good influence. Yes. Um, I just uh, I, I know we're getting close to like the time, but I just have just a couple questions I really want to ask you after all these years. Um, First of all, is I have the um the review the, the uh, that came in the, the past review of the first concert. So have you guys. They Triumph teaches a lesson in rock dancing. Okay, what's that all about? Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. I don't remember dancing at that show or there being any dancing. Do you, do you remember the dancing? I honestly, I don't. Like maybe it's like I was jumping around or something, you know. And so their idea of dancing is, I don't know, me jumping off a drum riser or sliding on my knees or something. I don't know. Yeah, I I, I remember that also being the very first time I ever heard the uh, uh phrase uh, "disco sucks" before. Because like going into that concert, I thought disco was okay, you know. But then you guys told me it sucked, so it sucked then for for the rest of my Dude. life. So. And I was never that was you know like one of the ways that uh, like that thing that I mentioned earlier about Sebastian Bach saying, "Oh, the drummer came down off the drum riser and he became the front man." We always wanted to establish each guy's personality and identity. And it was hard with Gil was, you know, the back end, side of the stage and up behind all of these drums. So, you know, we sort of concocted this idea of him coming out and doing a big rap. And he never knew what he was going to do. He was kind of like just feeding on Billy Graham, uh, you know, gospel preaching, head Nugent stream of consciousness kind of energy and so one night out of his mouth came this thing about ah, 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 disco disco sucks and it, you know the audience he got a big rise out of the audience and it was like oh i guess that's gonna be there tomorrow night too and sure enough it became this kind of standard thing that he did night after night on a couple of tours and i went oh boy you know okay yeah. <laughs> Well, so but, you guys helped, you helped, guy, you helped kill Disco. So that was a good thing. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, you listen to those Bee Gees records now, and they're good songs, man. And I know, they're, like, they're well produced. And like, I, there was some disco that I liked, you know, like, hey, the middle part of Hold On, when it breaks down, and then you hear the guitar go, jink, 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 and Mike goes, boom, 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 bo
boom, 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 it's it's disco. And I like it. It's like it grooves. It's perfectly fine. Like I like music, you know, and if I'm if my intention is honest and and forthright and and um then I think uh, that kind of music deserves to be considered, you know, and yeah. this is, let me give it to you this way. I taught uh, in a college for a long time and some recitals you're hearing stuff and it's, it's really good. It, they've really taken a lot of care and, and they're very good musicians and and some stuff you're hearing. Whoa, not so much, you know, they're, Good try, but whoa, and you should have probably, whoa, you remember, you know, you might. But I always felt if they were trying to be um, honest with what they were doing and it was their best intention, best effort, then I I was not going to be a critic. I was not going to smash them for that. I was going to, you know, try to be, uh, uh, what's the right word, you know, constructive in 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 the, the comments that i would make you know because i i think all music has value if when my kids were little and they would come home and sing me a song they learned at school what am i going to do say oh you're out of key that's fucking that's awful that's horrible you, shut up no i'm gonna go you're amazing that's fantastic what a great song so i'm painting a, a pretty vivid picture but i'm there's a scale of this that I think has to remain true to every style of music, every every type of musician, every genre. So I was never into the whole disco sucks thing because yes, some disco music probably sucked, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe as a lifestyle, you know, if you were doing too much cocaine at Studio 54, yeah, maybe that sucked, you know, maybe that wasn't too good, you know, but you know, you could say the same thing about some kinds of rock and roll too, couldn't you? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question. Then you see the tour book back there, the Allied Forces one, right? So that was a great Saturday night in Buffalo, Triumph Plane with a opening act, uh, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. And somebody that I never, I kind of like, oh, she used to be in a group called The Runaway. So, okay, cool. I've never seen anyone get booed off the stage before in my life. It was terrible for her on that evening. So, it, that, what that, do you remember? Whoever figured that was a good double bill didn't really figure it out. And that used to happen a lot in those days of rock and roll where, uh, and this is because of um, acts that weren't really hip to the way the business worked. Managers who were then just going, well, the record company wants us to get them in front of people. So let's just get them opening act slots on tours. You go, no, that that doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily, necessarily make good sense you know uh w- there was a, a venue that we played th- i think three times in chicago the aragon ballroom they were everywhere they were in atlanta i think there was one in maybe it was the agora in cleveland but anyways uh yeah so so we played that that ballroom and um they had a tradition there in chicago if they didn't like the opening act they would not sell beer in in bottles they would pour it into paper cups but the audience would start throwing the paper cups uh with a little bit of fluid in them so that they would carry and they would bomb the stage with these paper cups until the poor act the opening act could be knee deep in paper cups as they you know tried to get around on the stage and it happened april wine opened for us there once and they were a perfectly good legitimately solid rock band with good harmony singing and great guitar playing and and these these you know assholes at the aragon ballroom in chicago the, the, you know threw these cups until the poor guys were waiting around and they went we've had enough and they quit and they they left you know and then the audience would go like yeah we got rid of them okay give us triumph because triumph's what we want and of course that was just literally promoters and managers not understanding if you're going to put a multi-act thing together, pick acts that are going to share an audience in terms of tastes and things like don't. And I feel bad. Now, you, you mentioned Joan Jett. I'm going to say this. The first gig we ever played in the United States 
at the Municipal Auditorium in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, at concert, I'm saying, because we we played gigs in, in, as we said before, bars in Buffalo, and I think we crossed over into Niagara Falls once, in Detroit once, and et cetera, et cetera. But we got this offer to go down there because Sammy Hager had dropped out, and one of the opening acts was the Runaways. Oh. And so I have pictures of me backstage with a very young Lita Ford, and I was wearing a jumpsuit that had a zipper. There's a picture in my memoir. And Lita has reached over and has pulled the zipper as far down as it will go, you know, and that's when they took the picture. Oh. And it's like now, and Joan is in the picture. She's beside Mike Levine. Uh, and, you know, and the promoters are there and like, uh, and they, they were all of 17 years old or something, you know, at the time, 1977, 78, probably. Yeah. 77, 77. Yeah. But that was the beginning for us, you know, because it was a headline thing and we got to do our big show and the, the people in San Antonio went, yeah, they, they've got a flamethrower. <laughs> well, well, well let's look at the... They didn't get booed off the... Well, that no, the, the, well that's good. Um, I, I wondered, like, how you felt on the 1986 um, tour when you took out Yngwie Malmsteen. I mean, at the time, he was like the hot guitar player and all the guitar player magazines and that i thought it was a really good double bill but how did you feel having someone like that on the, the play I liked you know, it. yeah the the first uh the first night or two that he played he kind of went over time and he and he was uh being like sort of egocentric in the what he was doing and then they they were gonna there was talk like they were gonna fire him off the tour and I and I said, eh, let just let me go talk to him in his dressing room. You know, guitar player to guitar player. And so, and I think it helped that I was a columnist for Guitar Player Magazine, and he knew that, right? He was the kind of guy that would know that. So, and when I went into his dressing room and I sat down with him, I said, "Look, Ingvi, you are an incredible guitar player." You know, I was smooching his. But, you know, and going, look, and he, because he is, he, you know, what he does, he's, he's very singularly good at it, you know? Um, and I said, but, you know, you're out here on the tour with us. We're going to let you do your thing. But when you get to the, you know, 822 mark, you're done. And you must realize that uh, this is a professional enterprise. We want you to succeed. We want the audience to be happy. We want you to be able to do a great show. But at 822, when your time is up, you can't keep playing for the next half hour. You're going to put the show into overtime. You're going to cost me money out of my pocket. So be reasonable to me and my business and the business of Triumph. And don't go overtime. And you'll be fine. It'll be great. We can do a lot of shows together and, and it'll work. And he was looking at me like, I don't think anybody ever talked to me this straight before, you know. And he went, yeah, okay. And he never played one second over time after that night. He played his show, and and it was good. It was great. He'd do those things where he'd swing the guitar around on his strap, and he'd, you know, hit his poses and play his Richie Blackmore licks, and then play his sweep. He was he was a tremendous player, you know. His band, yeah, you know, and the style of music. After you'd heard three or four songs, you'd. You kind of heard every trick that was in the book, kind of. So it wasn't really my cup of tea necessarily, but th there's people that love that, right? There's people that really do love guitar heroes, and that's what he was, you know. Um, and it was a good double bill. He fit with Triumph, I think, the sensibility wise, style wise. It, it was a much better fit than Joan Jack and the Blackhearts. <laughs> One more thing I want to say when he came out on that tour, th this was something that I thought was really, really cool. It said he had the he had a t-shirt, a tour t-shirt, and on the front it said Ingve who? Question mark. And on the back it said Ingve fucking Malmstein, that's who. And there was an attitude to that that I think it really spoke to Americans in a strong way. I think Americans love that kind of cocky attitude that he had. And he did have he had plenty of that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay, I wanted before we left the topic um i want to talk about the uh, us festival um and and that particular performance i i'm assuming that that was probably the largest crowd that you ever played in front of 
Yeah, I would say so. Yes. Yeah. It was By like far. a half million. <laughs> well, well I, you... a lot of exaggeration, a lot of hype, uh, you know, about that. I mean, it certainly was of its time, probably it was sort of the Woodstock of its time. So there's going to be lots of, you know, stories that get told who knows if they're true or not. And certainly there was at least a quarter of a million people there by my eyeballs flying over it, you know, and then standing in front of it where it was a sea of humanity that went as far out as your eye could see and disappeared over the hills and out of sight. And I went, Oh my God, you know, what is this? This is surreal in its scope. Um, but, uh, yeah, whatever. It was an, it was another gig. Yes. <laughs> Seriously, just another gig, huh? Wow. Well, okay. no, no, no. I, I, well, I don't mean that in the sense of, uh, that would be the attitude that I would adopt in my head before I went on. It's just right. another gig. Like we played the night before in Orlando, Florida or Tampa in Florida on a ZZ Top outdoor show. And I think the Orange Bowl. And so then, uh, yeah, or the Gator Bowl or someplace. And so then, and then we flew over. We we got an app. We, we got up. We got in a helicopter. We flew over to the US Festival. We kind of got ready backstage. We went on. We played the same show we played the night before. And it was like um, we only had to play about an hour. And the thing that I kept thinking was, look, Rick, don't go out too hard here. It's a hot day. Um, it, you, you could... You could run out of gas in a hurry here. So try to save it and try to sing really well because they got cameras everywhere. They're filming this. They're recording this. So think about this more like you're in the studio and you got to be able to really sing well. And I, so I was focusing on that, singing and playing well. And I did have, I think, a pretty good day. I think the evidence of it is that, yeah, it was a good day. That, that guy was, he was pretty awesome that day, you know. Um but yeah, I mean, kind of just another gig. I mean, we were on a bill with what, like Judas Priest, uh, Ozzy, um, Van Halen, uh, yeah, Motley Crue, Scorpions, uh, Fire you Riot. know, yep. yeah, it was a hard rock day, and we were this band that was a little bit the outlier, a little bit the you know the Canadian band, uh, the, the three guys that were dressing in white as opposed to black leather, and you know. Um, you know, Judas Priest, they, they rode Harleys on stage. That's how their show started. Right. They yeah. literally. And yeah. like, you know, we were kind of going, I was in a track shirt. <laughs> pair of white sneakers, you know, like, um, but uh, it was like uh, Wozniak, it was his money, Steve Wozniak from, from Apple Mac. He was, and he was just blowing it, you know, like, he didn't care. It was, it was just going to burn this money because if he didn't, he was just going to have to pay it to the IRS anyways. So he decided, well, I'll do this instead. Instead of paying taxes, I'll I'll burn a bunch of my money. Having he literally called it throwing a party for America, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I just wish I would have been in Buffalo instead. <laughs> that would have been yeah, a lot better. <laughs> yeah, stream music when you listen to it, or are you old school? Are you uh, vinyl? No. My my wife's Spotify plays in her house a fair bit because she's got Bluetooth on her phone, and so her playlists play with, um, a fair bit in the house. But no, here in my studio, which if I turn this around, you can sort of see, I have one stereo system here in the library section, and then over there up in the larger music, I have my digital oh. recording area, and, and I have a, a second system with uh, playback on the one wall. And that's all just CDs. That's all I have, CDs. Um, oh, what's that the, what's I the story to? with the uh, I, horse I, on there, on the wall? What's the, what's the uh, background story on that? That's Eli. I call this Eli's Loft. And um, Eli was a, a, a thing we bought. And um, it was like a carousel horse when we were decorating the house when our kids were little. And it was, I cut his, I uh, removed his left front and back legs and put, so he could go up on the wall where we had a big staircase and I painted him and I put a knee on his saddle blanket for Emmett and then when we moved here and he never really got a very good tail uh, he, uh, we had some peacock feathers sticking out of his butt but you know 
And uh, so when we moved here, I, we, we'd had museum guys literally box him up so that he wouldn't get wrecked and carefully bring him to in the basement in this house. And he went up on the wall there. I made a tail for him. And then I was looking at the E one day and I thought, I should give him a name now. Like I've inherited him. He's not really, he's my studio horse now. I'll call him Eli. Eli the Wonder Horse. And Eli was a prophet. Eli was a guy, uh, Elijah was taken up to heaven in, in a, He's one of the only people that got to go to heaven without dying. He was still alive when he, as a prophet. Wow. He was taken. That's one of the stories in the Bible. Um, and uh, but of course, the other story is that uh, Eli had a chariot of fire. That so you remember the movie Chariots of Fire? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. vaguely. I mean, don't quiz me on it, but yeah, I did watch it. But I don't know if I remember. Yeah. I I would remember yeah. Triumph stuff, but not that. Yeah. Well, that that's biblical in nature. That that was a chariot of fire that took Eli to heaven. And so um, if a chariot's got to have a horse, right? So I go, all right, so this is my this is my horse. This is Eli, my horse. And I sit around in my studio. A lot of times when I'm going, say, hey, I wonder if I should do this. Or I wonder. So I go, Eli, the wonder horse. Okay. So that's, and so I, 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 I had this wall when we renovated and we made this big room. I went, okay, uh, I'm going to turn this around now so you can see again. Like, this has got a cathedral ceiling in it, but you go up three steps to, to, to get up there, right? Yeah. So I that I was going to put him up there and put him under a light. And then it was just like, well, he's flying high above all the action. I go, okay, he's it's Eli's place. I'll call it Eli's loft. So that's the story of the horse. And every now and then I look at him. And the reason that um, I'm going into a lot of detail and telling the story is because this is in my book, Ten Telecaster Tales. And I tell the story about Eli. He's up there and he's taken on a kind of a poetic, metaphorical kind of value to me, which is he kind of reminds me that I'm supposed to get busy. I'm supposed to, you know, get back to work and stop floating off into tangents um, because he's representative of a kind of a spiritual discipline. And that's because I'm tying in yet one more thing. Uh, do you remember, or maybe you, you're too young to remember this, but do you remember um, a song by Laura Nero? It was called Eli's Coming. Three Dog Night had it as a hit. Eli's coming, hide your hot girl. Eli's coming, hide your hot girl. Better, you better, better, you better hide, girl. Great song. And in her life, there was a guy, Eli, and one of his one of her girlfriends said to her, Laura, watch out for Eli. He's He could be... He could be trouble. And so Eli, when she, and her song, that song is kind of, she's going, well, Eli, he might be really great. Might be really cool. Might be, but he also, oh, he could be a disaster. He could be, you, better, you better be careful. And I think creativity is like that. Sometimes you're chasing something and you could be absolutely wasting your time. <laughs> but sometimes you're chasing something well, it's going to turn out to be pretty good. Like whatever was in the air the day that I was writing, hold on, pretty good day. <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever whatever juice I drank before I went on for the US Festival, pretty good juice. It was a pretty good day, you know. It's hard to choose them. It's hard to know. So sometimes I look at the horse, I go, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, be careful. I get it, you know. You know, to try to keep it within certain boundaries, try to keep it within a certain amount of, you know, self-discipline. Like, I believe in self-discipline. Uh, I think it's an important thing to have. I think there's a there's a reason why great athletes are great. And it's because they can find more self-discipline than the average guy walking down the street. You know, I shouldn't say just guy, the average person, because... There's professional women's hockey leagues now and basketball leagues. And so it, it but that self-discipline, which is a physical thing too, right? Very similar for musicians. So Eli reminds me about self-discipline. I go, okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Well, I should spend some time practicing. Okay, okay, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, if, if I lived there, I would never leave that place with all those guitars. Are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> oh, man. Well, I hardly ever do. Sometimes my wife goes, 
what are you going to live here? What are you, you going to, would you like to come for dinner? You know, that kind of, she, <laughs> she's uh, she, sarcastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Rick, Anyways. I want to, Thank you so much for your time. And this was a great interview. And I, I hope I can do it again one day soon and not have to wait 45 years. But um, <laughs> hey, all good. Listen, when the Telecaster Tales comes out, we'll talk again. All right. OK, thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. All right. Sounds all right. good. All right. You all take right, it Tom. easy. OK.